We've got our next speaker up, guys. That speaker is Kyle Rush, and he is a man with a passion for A-B testing. Uh, he currently works at Optimizely as the head of optimization uh, and as a consultant. He's previously worked at The New Yorker, Blue State Digital, and of course the reason we're here and excited to have him to, to talk is that he has worked uh, on the Obama for America campaign at the last uh, US election. He's speaking to us uh, from New York as well, sorry. Uh, he's a Jekyll user with one of the most demanding high stakes use cases I can imagine for a web platform uh, and we're excited to hear from Kyle about how he's used Jekyll for that. Kyle, I hand over to you. All right, thanks Sam. Uh, super happy to be here. Um, uh, Jekyll is um, one of my favorite things. I, I wouldn't say that I'm you know, a, a power user or a hacker, um, but we, we had a use case on the Obama campaign um, and, and Jekyll seemed to make a good fit, um, and, and in the end, I think it really did. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about that today, uh, but just want to emphasize um, I'm a front-end engineer, but um, I haven't touched Jekyll since the Obama campaign, um, which, which was a, a few years ago. So I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of other people that have uh, much more knowledgeable question, or answers on, uh, on uh, Jekyll questions. All right, so let me share my screen here so I can get my slides up. All right, cool. So this is our pretty logo. Um, so first I want to uh, start off with um, some context um, so that everybody knows sort of what we jumped into when we joined the Obama campaign. Um, uh, and actually these are just context specific for these for, for the Jekyll website that we built um, that handled um, a, a large percentage of our, our donations. Um, so this platform was responsible for about $250 million uh, in donations. Um, we processed about 4.27 million donations overall um, just for this platform, and it served up about 81.5 million page views over its lifespan, um, had about 17.8 million unique visits, uh, so you can see we got a lot of uh, return visits, um, and it had about a six-month lifespan, so this wasn't a platform that we had over the course of the entire campaign. Um, this was um, something that we had already hit the ground running with and were stumbling with a lot of other platforms. Um, so we built this to spec, um, and, and we had uh, about a year's worth of experience on the campaign by that point um, to decide what sort of platform we were going to do. So we had a lot of context um, and a lot of requirements, and we had it really well spec'd out. Um, and so this is what we came up for the last um, six months of the campaign. All right, so a little bit more context here. Um, so this is um, stepping back just a little bit um, for the overall campaign, not just necessarily the uh, platform that we were building. Um, but in 2008, uh, the Obama campaign raised 500 million online, which uh, broke George W. Bush's record before that, um, which also broke a record before that. Um, so we're continually um, breaking records, which is um, really, really tough to do. Um, I mean, 500 million is a lot of money. and um, when we started the campaign, uh, when I joined very early on uh, in June of 2011, a lot of uh, media outlets in the U.S. were projecting that we would raise a billion dollars um, total. Um, they didn't really break that down between online and um, you know checks coming to the campaign, um, but still, a billion is a lot of money. Um, Obviously, the stakes are very, very high when you're working on software for the president of the United States of America, um, and you know, depending on how you feel about politics, that makes the stakes even um, bigger. I myself am a political junkie, and the type of people that will come to a political campaign um, also feel very passionately. So, you know, to us, this is more than just um, making sure that your company's stock price is, you know, going up and not going down. Or uh, most people don't even really care about that sort of thing. But um, we were dealing with issues that really um, are near and dear to our hearts, right? So we really believe in the cause that we were doing, and we felt that any sort of failure um, in, in that, you know, our, our opponent getting into office would have had, you know, pretty bad effects. Um, I don't want to make this a political speech, but I just want everybody to know, you know, how we feel and, and how we felt when we were making this um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the stakes uh, as we understood them. Um, the last thing that I w would like to point out um, is our candidate was Mitt Romney, who um, has a lot of very, very wealthy friends. Um, and it's, it's um, you know, we raised a lot of money on the Obama campaign, but throughout the campaign we were neck and neck with Mitt Romney, um, and even though we were breaking records. So um, this is, it was never a situation where 
okay, we're ahead in the polls, but we're beating Mitt Romney in money. We were almost always tied, and there were a lot of quarters where Mitt Romney beat us in money. So um, the money race, um, you know, is unfortunately very important in an American presidential campaign. But, you know, it was always um, very neck and neck, and, um, you know, we were always trying really, really hard to get ahead. Um, so that's what we sort of jumped into. Um, I'm going to skip past these pictures because this was a uh, political joke that didn't go so well in some past talks, so um, I'll skip past those. Um, so first I want to um, talk about what we started with. So when I joined the campaign in June 2011, um, as you might imagine, we were pretty reliant on a lot of vendor software. So um, this is you know, a pretty basic um, architecture diagram. I'm sure a lot of you guys are um, pretty familiar with something like this. We've got the user up top and then um, on the bottom. Uh, we have a load balancer, and then we've got two clusters. Um, so the web cluster would serve up um, all of the static assets. Um, and actually, we weren't uh, doing um, static HTML at this point. Um, these HTML pages were actually um, put together by the server and then served out. So um, there wasn't a ton of caching, which was part of the problem. Um, but it also served up the, G the CSS, JavaScript, and images. Um, and there was about seven nodes on that cluster. And then uh, we had a payment cluster. So um, if you were on the donation page and then you submitted a donation, um, your request would then go to the load balancer would send your request to the payment cluster, which had two nodes on it. And that's where we would actually process your donation. Um, so this works pretty well if you're a small nonprofit um, and you're not um, you know, running a presidential campaign or um, you're not trying to process $3 million an hour of donations um, during the middle of the Democratic National Convention. Um, but, you know, so we, you know, obviously hit failure a lot of times in this system, um, and we had to re-architect something um, a lot more scalable um, and a lot easier to edit, too, because, um, like I said, this was vendor software, um, and it's, it wasn't really built to our spec. This, this vendor had, uh, is, they're called Blue State Digital, but they've been around for quite a while. Um, and so we were dealing with some, you know, pretty interesting proprietary CMS challenges. Um, to do all of this stuff. So um, some of the problems with this um, architecture, um, just from a performance perspective, um, were that it had was that it had a five to second um, second average load time, um, which is just absolutely horrible. Um, and that would even get worse as the load um, uh, affected the uh, web cluster. Um, but you know, five to seven second average is just atrocious, um, and I'm absolutely positive that that was affecting the conversion rate of the page. Um, there was no CDN, so this wasn't distributed. This were, these were hosted um, not even on AWS. It was um, in a data center that our vendor um, controlled, so it was actually like physical hardware that they were uh, managing themselves um, out of Boston. Uh, so every single request went to Boston. Um, it wasn't distributed at all. Um, like I said before, there was no caching. Um, our CSS and JavaScript and images were cached, but there was no caching for the HTML. So um, that's you know a big problem uh, because you can't even get the static assets until the HTML loads. Um, and um, when we started, we um, inherited uh, you know this sort of templating wrapper um, that had 46 requests in it. Some of those um, were uh, specific to uh, the template that we had built built, but um, a lot of them were. They were part of this um, hosted um, CMS that processed donations from our vendor. Um, so obviously very, very terrible for, um, for performance. Uh, and so obviously we knew we had to do something about that. So what we asked the donor or the uh, vendor to do was turn their hosted system into an API. Um, and in, in this case, it wasn't actually all that hard to do that because um, they were accepting um, post requests, and then once they processed the post request for the donation, they would um, return an HTML document. Um, so all we asked them to do is instead of returning an HTML document, can you just send us JSON? Um, and then that's basically the foundation for a donation API. It was very Stripe-inspired. So um, when we put a donate API into the mix, this is sort of the... Um, architecture that we're looking at. Um, so actually, what you have up top is the user. Um, and then this new platform that we created called contribute.barackobama.com. Um, and then anything on slash page, uh, we just sent a reverse proxy. So we would post the donations to the path slash page. Um, and then we set up a reverse proxy in Akamai that then sent the request off to uh, Blue State Digital. 
Um, we used a reverse proxy on the Edge server, the CDN, because um, this was 2012 where core support um, wasn't all that great. I mean, we had to support you know, all the way back to IE7, I believe. So um, we needed to have a solution that worked for those browsers. Um, and so in Akamai, it's kind of complicated to set up a reverse proxy, but we had Rockstar DevOps people uh, that set that up for us. So um, we were off pretty quickly um, with that. So this is like you know one step uh, towards what we would eventually get to. Um, but that only gets us processing donations. We still need to serve something to the user. And so um, we really had to think about what we were going to do. Um, I think Jekyll was pretty popular um, at the time, um, but it definitely wasn't as popular as it is now. You know, now it's sort of a no-brainer for like little um, static, small, simple websites. Um, but I, I remember a lot of the guys on the 2012 campaign. We had about uh, 20 front-end engineers. Um, uh, you know, a lot of us weren't all that familiar and didn't have experience with Jekyll. Now I think it's pretty rare that you'd see a front-end engineer that either doesn't know what Jekyll is or has never used it. Um, and so we, we looked, you know, a lot of different options. Um, our director of front-end engineering um, had some experience with Jekyll and, and loved it. So um, we gave that a look. And we, we all like the solution because static is very secure um, and it's very quick. And those are two really big things when you're talking about a donation conversion rate in a tight money race. So um, when we put um, Jekyll and GitHub into this, um, what we have is just an S3 bucket as our origin server, which is obviously you know amazing. Um, we don't have to actually manage any server there. It's just a static bucket, a uh, little static asset server. Um, and then behind that is Jekyll and GitHub. So um, this was, um, you know, I think we're on Jekyll 2 now, I believe, but um, this was way before um, Jekyll could do, like, you know, uh, data or anything like that. Um, and so we, we um, wrote our templates, we put all that together, and then um, we wrote a deploy script, um, and we managed all of that through GitHub. So as soon as you would um, push in GitHub, it would trigger a, a build. It would build all of the donation pages, and then it would push them up to the S3 bucket and it would also um, invalidate the Akamai cache at the same time because the uh, CDN had an API. Um, and, and we did that kind of smartly. We would, um, since we're dealing with uh, static um, HTML files that Jekyll generated, we could um, do a diff. We actually watched all of the um, output HTML files in our repo. So we could do a diff between um, uh, the head uh, and the previous commit, and we could get all of the HTML files that were changed. So then we'd gather all of those file paths, and then we would send those file paths off to Akamai to um, change those URLs. Um, the reason why that was important is because most CDNs, if you just do a star um, cache bus where you bus the entire cache, that will take like sometimes like a half hour, which we really don't have time to wait a half hour to, to um, update the HTML pages. Uh, but if you send an individual path uh, on Akamai, it will invalidate it in, I think, seven minutes or so, or maybe it's less now. Um, but that's why we put that extra effort in there to um, perform the diff in our deploy script and pull out those um, file paths. Um, so this is, um, at this point, we have like a working um, solution, but it's not really all that scalable. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about um, our static assets. Um, because in this diagram, all we have is a payment processor and um, HTML getting served. So um, here's what we did with our static assets. You know, obviously very simple. Um, we just put that behind Akamai, and um, we sent all of those through an S3 bucket. Um, some pretty basic stuff that everybody's um, very familiar with. Um, we weren't using um, SAS to compile our CSS back then because it wasn't really all that popular. Uh, we were using um, other things that we had built. Um, but you know this is sort of a functioning website right here. Um, but we couldn't stop here because there's still a lot of um, you know scalability um, that we need to uh, account for in this uh, payment processor that you see um, listed as BSD payments. So um, actually, this is what we ended up testing um, when we when we first had this built. Um, we improved upon it as I'll show you in a minute. But um, this is when we went to production. Um, this is what we did. Um, and we had the idea to A-B test it um, because we wanted to see um, how much difference in the conversion rate all of this work um, took. It actually didn't take all that long to put this together. Um, I think it took Blue State about three days to turn their hosted solution into an API, um, which was amazing. And then um, it, you know, it probably took us about a month to set up all the Jekyll templates and implement all the designs that we had. 
um, and set up the S3 bucket. You know, we're working with uh, DevOps to set up all that stuff. So that took probably about a month. Um, uh, you know, overall. And so um, when we when we looked at the performance of this, we used a web page test. We used you know our, our local machines. Um, we used a lot of different tools. It was a while ago, so I can't really remember now. Um, but some of these are numbers are averages across many different tools. Um, but we got an 80% faster time to paint. Um, back then, people weren't really focusing on time to paint. They were focusing on page load. But you know, I think we're all pretty much on board that time to paint is the metric. Um, this is reflected in um, Google PageSpeed results now, but it wasn't at the time. Uh, but this is that's something that we were really focusing on. Um, for those that don't know, that's um, how quickly the browser can paint something on the screen. So how quickly you see um, something on the on the you know on the web page doesn't mean that all the static assets are loaded, uh, but it does mean that there's at least you know a usable uh, or a mostly usable web page. Um, here's a film strip from webpagetest.com that we use to test this. So um, up at the top you have the OFA Obama for America version, um, which is the past version, and then down at the bottom you have uh, the Blue State Digital version, the hosted solution. Um, and you can see like each uh, tile in this film strip is a second. So um, what's important to note is that um, the time to paint for the OFA version was one second, um, but the total page render happened on two seconds. So um, the page on the left doesn't have any images in it. It doesn't have our logo, and it doesn't have the image of the president. But for all intents and purposes, it's a usable page. A person can start interacting with that page after one second. Um, you know, they don't have to necessarily wait for the images to load. So um, that's why time to paint was important for us, right? And then on the bottom, you see that, um, and I don't know how this happened, but for some strange reason, um, the vendor's time to paint and total page load happened um, within uh, uh, five to six seconds. Um, so you see them all the way down there um, for the page load. So um, this is a huge win for us. Um, and there's, there's also some other things uh, that we reduced. So we got a 63% reduction in page weight. Um, and that's just you know, the amount of kilobytes that are uh, transferred um, to, the, to the client's uh, machine that's performing the request for the web page. Um, and that's not just the HTML. It's all the static assets. We refactored a lot of that. Um, we had a 52% reduction in um, HTTP requests, which is obviously a huge impact in, in, in uh, page speed. And, um, here are the results from our A-B test. Um, uh, I'm going to go back just um, a little bit just so that you guys can see these um, two pages again. Um, when we uh, A-B tested this, we consciously made the decision not to alter the design for the, um, for the new version. We had new designs to put into production, but we didn't, um, we didn't change the design because we wanted to A-B test the pages against each other. Um, since this is uh, a totally new system that we had built, we wanted to A-B test it, and, and if we had changed the design, that's a variable that we weren't controlling for, and so that design could be impacting the conversion rate. But when we keep the design the same, then it just becomes a test of the code, the underlying code. And so um, that's the reason why when we launched this, it looked identical to um, what was already in production. And um, you know that's sort of a hard sell to people. So when you say, like, hey, give us a month's worth of time to produce an exactly identical um, web page, um, people are like, no, we have other designs that we want to iterate on. Um, but you know, we ended up making the case um, that the investment in uh, you know our ability to iterate on these from an engineering perspective and um, the uh, increase uh, or the reduction in page load time would be worth that month-long investment. So um, let's look at the A/B test results. So when we A-B tested this, we A-B tested it about, I think, five times, just to be sure. Um, we had a 14% average increase in the conversion rate. Um, and again, when you're talking about numbers like 250 million, um, that is huge. So when you look at the average contribution size um, of this platform while it was in production, um, and you, um, uh, you do the math with a 14% conversion rate, the number you end up is 13, the number you end up with is 13, 32 million. So our estimate is that um, creating this new platform that was um, based on Jekyll um, and, and static architecture just in general uh, saved us about 32 million in the long run. Um, that's a lot of money in a tight fundraising race. A lot of the times in our uh, Federal Election Commission reports, um, 
you know, Mitt Romney was not really all that ahead of us. Um, if we could take, you know, you know, another five million from that fundraising quarter, another ten million from that fundraising quarter, and put that in the report, um, that has a big impact in the race because the media uh, definitely reports on um, fundraising numbers, and that's sort of a sign of health for the the campaigns that are running. So whoever's ahead in money is seen as having a more uh, healthy campaign. So in the end, this turned out to be a huge win, obviously worth a month-long investment. Um, it's very high ROI on something like that. Um, but as I was saying before, that architecture wasn't really that scalable because um, we were still on... Um, that uh, those payment clusters, uh, those you know, only two nodes for those payment clusters with our vendor. So um, we iterated on this, of course, um, and that's what um, we want to talk about now is uh, redundancy. So the reason that uh, redundancy was important is because um, at certain points of the campaign we were processing uh, three million dollars an hour. So that was that ended up being our peak uh, for the campaign. That's a lot of money that's coming in, um, and again, I can't emphasize how uh, uh, enough how uh, tight the fundraising race was and, and how much the media is, is um, putting a spotlight on, on that as a general health indicator of a, of a political campaign. Um, and so this architecture diagram, it just really doesn't scale well for something like that. Um, even, you know, let's say uh, 20 minutes of downtime, um, you know, it seems like maybe a little bit of a long time, um, but when you're processing $3 million an hour, um, your boss think that, thinks that that's like two years. Um, it's sort of like you know Einstein's re uh, theory of relativity, um, and, and this is like how it relates to uh, political races. Um, you know, uh, if you consider gravity, um, you know, getting really, really heavy, uh, or and, and having a harder pull um, as the uh, the amount of uh, money that's coming in. That's how you know time goes slower during that point in time. And so, uh, if you're only down, you know, like let's say ten minutes. Um, that feels like you know, you know, probably a week um, when you're when you're not close to um, uh, something that has strong gravity or you know a, a, high, a high processing of, of donations. So um, we we got bit in the ass because um, we went down a couple of times. Um, so we had to we had to iterate on this and, and keep making it better. So um, here's what we actually ended up with at the end of the campaign. Um, it's a lot more complicated than the previous diagram, um, but I'm just going to walk you guys through it. Um, it's worth noting that um, we relied really heavily on AWS because, um, I mean, I think, you know, obviously a lot of people rely on AWS, but it's particularly useful for a political campaign because political campaigns usually only last about 18 months. Um, and so you'll see a lot of companies will switch off of AWS because in the long term they can save some money by managing their own equipment. Um, or, or not having um, you know like scalable stuff like uh, uh, AWS offers, but um, for us, you know, everything goes away at the end of the camp at the end of the campaign. We're not you know nobody's employed by the end of the campaign. Um, none of that software is really maintained, and so it's you know literally a race to the end. And then once that's done, everything dies. And um, that's you know AWS is just a perfect use case for that. Um, all right, so we never ended up changing our static assets. Um, those stayed the same. Um, we kept, uh, you know, Jekyll in there. It was doing great for us. Um, we kept hosting it on uh, S3, um, and, uh, you know, that was still um, behind an Akamai uh, a pull zone. So when somebody sent a request to slash donation, it would uh, pull from AW the AWS S3 bucket. Um, and I, I think that there's probably different ways to do the caching, but uh, I just want to cover that really quick right now. Um, back then, what we would do is um, we would send up the HTML files to S3, and we would cache them um, indefinitely. So we would put a cache a header of, I think, uh, a year or two years, so that would stay on the Edge server forever. And then um, every time we pushed a change, we would invalidate the, the cache um, for that URL um, through our deploy script, um, and then that would get pushed live through Akamai in about seven minutes. Um, and we did that because um, at that point in time, I think that was the only way to keep HTML assets on uh, the Edge server um, uh, forever, right? Without them, without the Edge server having to hit your origin server, um, which you know that decreases the performance. So we didn't want uh, the Edge server to hit origin ever until the page was actually updated. All right. So then the right part of the architecture diagram is you know obviously a lot more heavy. So um, 
the, the part that required a lot of sophistication is um, the, uh, the payment processor. So when we would, the user would submit a post request to actually process a donation, um, that would go to the path slash page. Um, and in Akamai, we set up a reverse proxy. So, um, and we needed the reverse proxy because um, you can't actually do a post request to AWS, to an S3 bucket, right? That's not going to do anything. There's no application there to accept that, and S3 won't accept it. So um, that, that I know of. So um, we sent it to a slash page, and Akamai allows you to set up a reverse proxy for any path. So um, anything to slash page was um, uh, proxied off to um, AWS. And so the AWS um, structure uh, we had up at the top, we had AWS uh, Route 53 weighted round robin. Um, and this product was really, really, really useful for us um, in the campaign because it allowed us to um, switch between two different payment processors. So what we ended up doing um, is replicating the Blue State Digital uh, payment processor. We, we uh, took the spec and then we um, built our own version of that. So we hooked our application up to a payment gateway. Um, we built out the API so it uh, matched Blue State exactly. And that way we could send, um, as, a, you know, as a load balancing mechanism, we could send uh, donations to either BSD or to Akamai. Um, we could control the split. So um, if one uh, version of the donation API was unhealthy, um, we could switch 100% of traffic over to uh, the campaign's version of the donation processor. If, um, you know, for some reason the, the campaign went down, we would send that to um, uh, our external vendor, Blue State Digital. Um, what's really interesting, I think, is the way that we handled um, our uh, redundancy and failover uh, in, in, uh, for the donations version of the, or sorry, the campaign's version of the donation processor. So um, we put an Akamai uh, GTM geo failover um, in front, and um, behind that was two EC2 um, uh, uh, applications, but they were in different uh, data centers. So um, we had one application operating out of uh, the East Coast, I think it was in Virginia, and then we had another identical application running out of uh, the West Coast, I think it was Northern California. And so um, the Akamai uh, GTM geo failover allows us, um, allows us to switch between um, the East and the West um, based on two things. So um, you can set it so that any uh, IP address that's in the western side of the country would go to the um, the data center in the west, and then if you had an IP address that was in the eastern side of the country, it would go to the east. So we had a uh, geo load balance that way. Um, but then the Akamai GTM part of that would um, ping each uh, EC2 application to figure out what the health is, and if one of them went down, then it would switch all of the uh, traffic from the entire country to either the east or the west, whichever one was still up and running. Um, so we had several points of redundancy in here. If both our um, east and west coast uh, applications went down, then we'd fail over to Blue State Digital completely. Um, but if, let's say, Blue State Digital went down and then, you know, um, uh, uh, our east coast data center for some reason had some issues, um, we would send all the donations to the west. Um, and that actually did happen. So I don't know if you guys remember, but in 2012 there was a hurricane um, that hit Virginia um, and that knocked out um, the East Coast, um, the Northern Virginia East Coast Amazon data center um, for quite a long time. I think it was like several hours. Um, but we didn't go down because um, we had this failover. So once we put this architecture in place, um, we never went down, which was pretty awesome. All right, so um, the reason that I think, um, or I should say the reason that I uh, give this talk and I, I wrote a blog post about it um, is because, um, and I want to highlight two little pieces of this architecture diagram, even though it's all um, very fancy or was fancy at the time. Um, iteration and workflow are so important, um, especially to me because um, I'm all about A-B testing. And um, when you subscribe to a philosophy of A-B testing, and I think we're all pretty much on board with that, uh, basically, what we're saying is that our application is never done, right? It's, it can always use improvement. Um, and so we ran about 500 A-B tests over the course of this, um, over the course of this campaign. And it really, um, you know, the, the larger architecture diagram, all the pieces in blue were part of that. Um, but all the magic was really happening on these pieces in orange. 
Um, that's where we iterated on the user interface. Um, and had we picked a solution that um, you know had a database um, and you know allowed people to log into that, we we would have you know to deal with like security concerns. We'd have to deal with permissioning. We'd have to deal with um, making sure that uh, you know the remote database is is backed up and making sure that the remote database can sync with your local database so that you can test your new templates. Um, and and that requires a whole level of uh, complexity that really really slows down um, iteration and workflow. But because we went so simple and we went static and, and S3, we were able to iterate on these pages, you know, in under like a day. We would come out with new designs in under a day. Um, we had a team of about five front end engineers that just worked on this architecture diagram, um, and specifically just the orange part. Um, and you know, they would get new designs, and they were so fast that they would, you know. If, you, if, a, if an engineer has a, a good you know, environment where they can work locally and they can test things locally, um, and then they have a, a remote staging where they can get approvals or uh, if they want to test it remotely, and that all works really, really fluently, um, that engineer is super productive. Um, and I saw that firsthand. I would you know, hand off a design to one of our front-end engineers, and they would push out these designs um, in you know, like less than a day, uh, and depending on you know, how, how much of a change it was. Um, and I credit Jekyll with a lot of that, right? Because, um, like I said, we're not dealing with uh, any of these database complications. It's just a templating system, um, and it was perfect for this project. Jekyll's not perfect for every project, obviously. If you try to, um, you know, put uh, so I worked at the New Yorker, but there's, you know, there's no way that we could put NewYorker.com on Jekyll because we need an interface for hundreds of journalists to log in and put their their stories in. Um, but for this one use case, I think it was, you know, probably the best decision we made um, out, out of the whole architecture diagram to go with Jekyll because um, that allowed us to run all of these A/B tests, um, and I'll cover how much uh, money we estimate that we won from the A/B tests. Um, but I think that that money far outweighs all of the um, redundancy that we built in because, um, you know, we might have been down even if we were down for like an hour total over the course of the campaign. Um, during peak uh, processing times, that's about $3 million. Um, I know for a fact that we gained a lot more than $3 million uh, by running all the A-B tests and iterating on those. And if we didn't have a system like Jekyll, we couldn't have done it fast. All right, so um, this is sort of the impact of, uh, of Jekyll and, and the entire architecture diagram. Um, so over a course of six months, we did about 1,101 front-end deploys on this system. Um, it contained uh, about 4,000 lines of JavaScript that was just for this platform um, to process all these donations. Um, it was responsive, which I know is not sexy at all anymore, but at the time um, we had the first uh, political website that was responsive, um, and I think the Boston Globe had um, just started going responsive at that at that point in time, or they were investigating it, or Ethan Marcode had signed on or something, um, and that was like the first big website for that to happen to, but it definitely wasn't a pervasive philosophy at the time. Um, we ran 240 A-B tests just on the donation page. Um, the other 500 that I mentioned were done on uh, our ads landing pages, which are obviously um, really high ROI there, too. Um, and we got a 49% increase in the donation conversion rate. Um, and so, again, just to reiterate, um, when you're talking about ROI, um, it's important to step back and think about what's going to give you an RO a good ROI. Um, implementing a static system like Jekyll allowed us to iterate to increase the conversion rate by 49%. Um, making all of those performance improvements and not being down, you know, probably got us, um, uh, well, I know that the performance increase got us about 14%, um, but uh, uh, not being down did not increase that by, you know, like the difference of between 14 and 49%. Um, so, uh, again, that architecture diagram was very sexy to us at the time, and it took a lot of time to to put in place um, a lot of help from DevOps and, and some backend engineers. But really, the to me, what is so sexy about it is that um, we were using Jekyll, and our front-end engineers were able to iterate on it so quickly, um, unlike other CMSs like um, WordPress or whatever that require a much more complicated deploy process and a lot more support from DevOps and, and, and backend engineers. All right, um, so that's uh, pretty much all of my presentation. Um, happy to take questions, I guess. Awesome. awesome. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, the first question here uh, is from Tilo Meyer uh, from Twitter stream, M.Asia. He says, what would you change in your architecture if you are going to do it again for the 2016 campaign? 
Great question. Um, so I've actually just signed on um, to do uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign for 2016. Um, I don't know what I'm thinking for getting myself into something like that again. Um, we, uh, it's, it's very early, early days right now. Um, I have no idea how it will end up. Um, I, you know, my preference would be for us to um, have static architecture wherever possible. Um, there's um, a lot more choices than Jekyll now. Uh, I know we're at a Jekyll conference, but um, uh, you know, there. I think you know a lot of the cool um, node static site generators. I think are really interesting because um, those are built in JavaScript, and that's definitely in the front end developer toolset. Um, whereas uh, you know Ruby is is you know you find a lot of front end engineers that know Ruby, but they all know JavaScript. Um, so you know, I suspect we'll be relying probably more on um, JavaScript-based um, uh, static site generators. Um, I, am, I think we're obviously going to have um, one application in there um, that's running Jekyll. Maybe ten. I, you know, it's hard to say at this point. Um, I think uh, what we'll do different this time is that we will start with static. You know, we won't. Um, mm -hmm. It won't be static just for the last six months. Um, we'll be going static where we can, um, you know, uh, for much longer than that. Maybe in the first month or two, um, we'll have we'll have applications that are static, um, and so that'll be very different um, because we we went through a whole year of um, struggling with you know how to horizontally scale databases for CMSs, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't I don't want to go through that again. Um, you know, I'm not really good at DevOps. I think DevOps resources are always strained, um, uh, you know, no matter where you work. Um, and so it can be tough to get to get help to do that. So I think the big difference will be that we'll, we'll, a lot of our stuff will be static um, from very, very early on. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the campaign was sort of a race to the end um, and that all of the things, you know, you knew that the things you were building wouldn't be disposable. Uh, how does this affect the way that the team thinks? And do you think that, uh, like traditional people who are building traditional websites could take anything from the way that uh, those teams think. Yeah, I think um, the thing that we all learned, and I think um, what we walked away with, and and you know carry that knowledge on to you know startup jobs or wherever we went. Um, you know, some people went to Google, some people went to small startups. Um, is the uh, need for practicality. Um, you know, engineers, and I don't, I don't fault them for that. Um, I'm definitely uh, guilty of this. They want to build the prettiest code base that just makes, you know, the most sense, um, and they don't want any nonsense in the code base. Um, that's a really great goal to have. You know, it, it's really nice if you can onboard another engineer um, and they can just look at the code and it makes sense and it's very clean and there's no, um, you know, there's no to-dos and everything just is, is you know, in line with the philosophy of the application, um, that's great. But, um, you know, uh, Facebook has a, a famous saying that done is better than perfect. And when you're working on a campaign um, that has an end date, but like, you can't move the election if your application isn't ready. You know, you have an end date. Um, you you definitely have to be subscribed to the philosophy that done is better than perfect. And so um, a lot of the, you know, code that we wrote, I'm sure, wasn't um, the greatest code, but... Uh, you know, it's a high-pressure situation where you just look and see whatever open source um, software that you want to use to build a website. Uh, you put that together really quickly. Um, you may or may not have used it before. You hack on it, you know, for a day, and then and then you get that out. Um, and that's, you know, a, a practical approach. Um, so that's, you know, that's what I think is um, the most, you know, usable thing that, that people could walk away. And, and the, I think a lot of the things that um, a lot of uh, the, the campaign veterans are now um, pushing for, you know, where they work. Um, because you know, perfect me, perfect is just really the enemy of done, um, and it and it and it sucks. <laughs> cool, awesome. So, can you just clarify? Is or was A/B testing uh, common for on the campaigns or on those websites before the tech stack or the new tech stack, or is it something that the new tech stack really enabled? Um, yeah, so we were testing before. We were, we were testing from the very beginning. Um, but the, the problem is that um, testing is about iteration, right? And so mm -hmm. if you can't um, if you can't move quickly, so you know if you're if you're in a like traditional agile um, workflow where you you plan out your whole quarter, you know you've got your release planned out, um, you've got all the stuff that you're gonna you know push out that quarter. Um, that's fine. You're not really iterating that rapidly, but you're you know you're working at a comfortable pace. 
um, you don't have that luxury on a political campaign. You're you're deploying. You know, I mean, we like I said, we did you know over a thousand deploys in six months. Um, so you're working at like breakneck pace. Um, so you have to iterate fast, and that's what A/B testing is all about, right? A/B testing helps you learn what changes to your application uh, or what the impact is for changes to your application. Um, and when we were A/B testing in in the beginning, we realized that the tools that we were working with did not allow us to be effective with A/B testing, and that's why we had to re-architect the entire thing. So whereas in the beginning we might run an A/B test a week, um, once we threw Jekyll out there, we were A/B testing at least three times a day. So cool. you know it's a it's a huge difference in velocity there. That's a, yeah, that's a crazy increase. Uh, the static sites obviously have a lot of benefits. I mean. They got speed, they got scale, they got security. With the change from dynamic to static, was there any internal resistance um, from other other decision makers on the campaign? And if so, uh, what what was your response to that? Yeah, so I would say the the biggest um, pushback that we received is that um, people would not be able to publish donation pages like a, a normal stakeholder, so a digital organizer, someone who's not an engineer. Uh, could not jump in there and create a donation page, which is true. Um, and so that is a big problem because any time that anybody wants even the smallest change, let's say they want to change the title on a donation page, that's going to have to go through an engineer. Um, or, you know, maybe a product manager um, that's familiar with GitHub or, you know, someone someone like that. But it definitely can't be done by somebody who's organizing on the ground or anything. So um, that's the pushback we received. Um, the answer I always have for that is when you're working with something like Jekyll, it's so fast for a front-end engineer to make that change that it's not even really an issue, right? Like, um, generally speaking, engineers shouldn't be taking requests to like change copy and update images. Usually you want uh, the stakeholder to do that. Um, but uh, for us, it was so important to move at the pace that we were moving and, and to iterate so rapidly that we took on that burden. So anytime there were changes, um, we just figured out a system to make that happen quickly. Um, and in my opinion, it was totally worth it. So I think that's like the biggest drawback, right? Is is losing that ability for people to um, uh, push changes without the without the help of a developer. Cool. That is all the questions I have for you at the moment, uh, Kyle. Unless you've got any um, parting remarks, we're going to take a couple of minutes break before we bring on the next speaker. Nope, that's it from me. Awesome. Thank you very much, Kyle. All right. Bye.